let's go ahead and get started. We appreciate everybody taking the time to be here today to learn about self-directed IRAs and how they can be invested in small businesses, private companies, startups. Um, it's something that, you know, five to 10 accounts a day are doing here into some startup or small business or private company, at least. And, um, and so we see a lot. I just wanted to go over some of the things we think people should know when investing in those. Also, maybe how to find some of these deals. Um, and also for those of you that have a small business or a private company that may want other people's IRAs to invest in it. Um, so we're going to approach it from all those different angles with the uh, key point of focusing on how it works for the retirement accounts, because that's what we're all about there. Um, all right, I'm gonna share some slides here just a little bit. When they're important, I'll bring them up. But um, I am an attorney, so this is a little disclaimer behind me. Um, <laughs> I feel like there's like a teleprompter here. I know. I'll start scrolling. But um, just keep in mind, this is meant to be educational in nature. It doesn't cost an attorney-client relationship or financial or legal advice. Go seek that out from your own licensed professionals. Okay, that was attorney Matt. He's boring. He comes out every once in a while, but I have to say that. Um, a little bit about me, and I made these slides. So, Aaron, <laughs> you got to get your own slideshow, dude. There's, we don't have an about Aaron. So, we have an about Matt, though. So, but I'm the CEO of uh, Directed IRA. Um, Aaron works as COO. Uh, that's kind of a new title he's, uh, he's getting here, but um, it really is that COO function for those of you that may know what he does here. Uh, but I wrote the book, the Self Directed IRA Handbook, it's the number one book in the field, sold over 30,000 copies. Most of our competitors buy it for their new employees and this staff. Week? Yeah, so every, <laughs> so just that's an indication of the substantive nature of it that all of our competitors buy for their own employees. Um, I think that's a good sign. I'm also a partner at KQS Lawyers, where I spent a little bit of time only working on self-directed IRA clients that have accounts at Directed IRA. Um, host the Self-Directed IRA Summit, by the way, mm -hmm. which is October 22nd and 23rd here in Scottsdale. That's an awesome place to be in October. Uh, we'll do a golf tournament. A uh, half day, some networking, and then a full day with multiple sessions going on at the same time. That's a Friday, Saturday combo. Not recorded. Not recorded. Not live streamed. You gotta be there. Yeah. We're trying to make this an in-person, get back to that networking, high level meet people, too. get out of our COVID cave, and hopefully we'll be okay with that. But um, so that's gonna be October 22nd, 23rd. Now we do a virtual one. We'll do next year. We'll do a virtual version too. You can just uh, stream, but um, and then also I'm a VIP contributor for Entrepreneur Magazine. I contribute quite a bit. I've had at least five or six articles go number one on their site. And, uh, but I'm always writing on tax, legal, and retirement topics because that's what I like. All right. Um, I just want to talk for a second about like why we're talking about this. And, and I, as I said at the beginning, there's like two different angles, right? Mm -hmm. There's like people who are like, okay, I have an IRA and I want to invest in a startup. I want to invest in like the next big thing before it's like on the New York Stock Exchange or it's a public company. Like we had yesterday a call on that. Yeah. <laughs> or it's like, you know, I just want to invest in this little small business down the street. Mm -hmm. It's not going to go public, but it's a great profitable little business I want to go invest in that maybe my friend runs yeah. or, you know, my, my nephew's starting up or whatever. It's just this little small business. Like Gary V's best bud that started Uber. Yeah, yeah and like, he passed hey, on it. Yeah, he's like, hey, so Gary, uh, you want to do like 50, 100K and this thing that I'm going to call Uber, like <laughs> taxis for like individuals? He's like, no, nah, I'm good. <laughs> he's like, well, that would have been $10 billion. Yeah, like, so, so that's what we're talking about. <laughs> that's exactly what we're talking about. And, you know, we don't necessarily, I don't get the people asking me to invest in Uber, but I'm going to tell you. Um. There's places you can go that's going to increase mm -hmm. your opportunities for that. We're going to talk about that. And we see it from clients. I'm going to give some, some examples here of what we've seen people do successfully. But on the other end of the spectrum, so there's people that have IRAs. But then there's other people out there that are like, I'm a small business owner. Yeah. I'm a real estate investor. I'm starting up a company. I have a private fund, whatever it is. I want capital. I need to raise this from mm -hmm. people's IRAs. And so this is a really important topic for them to know. So I always say there's 35 reasons why we talk about self-directed IRAs in general, but you know, for, for any of you who haven't seen me speak before, there is now $35 trillion in US retirement accounts. All right. I haven't, I mean, I'm not that old, but when I started giving this little spiel and talking about this slide, it was back here at like 2015, 2017, when we were at 28 million. We're already up to 35, sorry, 28 trillion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right up to 35 trillion. So 
there's more money in retirement accounts to invest in startups and private companies than any other place. And so if you're someone that's got a small business and wants to raise capital or you've got a startup, this is where all the money's at. Mm -hmm. And so it's really important you learn it. Also, for everyone watching that has a self-directed IRA already or is interested in it to invest in a private company, I mean, you've got your little sliver of this. We want to go through the things you need to know as you're looking at investment and what are the rules I need to pay attention for um, in, in the private investment space. Okay, well, there's an elephant in the room um, and there's, that's no pun intended because Peter Till did speak at the Republican National Convention. But, uh, <laughs> you know, the big news this last couple months has been his $5 billion with a B, billion, Roth IRA. And he did it by investing in private companies, just small business, that were small businesses. Remember, he invested his IRA in PayPal at the very beginning stages, his early shares, and he invested his IRA in Facebook. Okay, those two companies were small businesses. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can call them a startup or whatever you mm -hmm. want, but it was small business. they were just a small business. Every, they're now huge companies, of course, and, you know, have billions of, I mean, they are huge, huge companies. And, but he didn't invest in this at the later stages on, in the stock market, right? Yeah. He didn't buy at the IPO even, all right? He was way, way earlier. And, and that's how his account went from thousands of dollars of initial contributions only to then returns of over 5 billion. And so that's been in the press. I'm sure many of you heard about it. Um, uh, I've worked with many clients similar to that. I'm just, you know, that's, uh, it's a, it's something you got to be careful about if you're involved personally in the company as he was, at least in PayPal. But Facebook's an easy one to understand. I just want to make sure I understand what he did with, uh, in Facebook. So he was the first outside investor in Facebook. Mm -hmm. When Facebook, you know, everybody's seen the movie, The Social Network with, um, what's his name? Jesse Eisenberg plays mm -hmm. Mark Zuckerberg. Sure, Jesse Eisenberg plays Mark Zuckerberg? That's not his name. I'm messing it up. But uh, somebody fact check that. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. But it's kind of it kind of chronicles the uh, starting of Facebook. It's you know a lot of people think it's totally inaccurate, but there's some important true things in that. And one is this first outside investor venture capitalist depicted in the movie that comes in and gives them their first outside money that wasn't Eduardo Saverin's parents' money mm -hmm. or family money or whatever was the first little seed they got. Well, that outside investor was Peter Thiel. And it was his Roth IRA that did it. And, um, and that was his huge investment where he took a big account from coming out of PayPal up to this billion dollar mm -hmm. account that we now have you know, him all over the press and how can you have a 5 billion Roth IRA? This is what he did. He invested in private companies. He did not buy a IPO stock. He did not like try and pick a stock and get a little bit of edge over the next person. He went in and found transformational businesses that he thought could change the world. And that's how he invested. And he stayed in his lane of what he was good at, tech. He was a tech guy. He got that. And he was a, a payments person with, with a, a PayPal and then understood where social media could go at the very early stages where Facebook, of course, was, was the big pioneer. So, um, so that's a little digest on, on Peter Thiel. There's some detail there and we can fill some questions on that, but, um, but let's just go to some other examples. So if you remember Mitt Romney, this is the last you know, person mm -hmm. we would always talk about running for president. And he disclosed in his financials when running for president that he had like a IRA. Big old IRA. Yeah, like <laughs> 30 million to 100 million? Yeah, 100 million plus. Well, what was he buying with his IRA, Aaron? Like Staples. <laughs> yeah, but it was like when it was private. One store, yeah. you know, it wasn't nationwide at that time. And, and he was investing in Sealy Mattress when it was like, no one ever heard what the heck that was. And then other companies, and so were some other, his uh, bank capital um, partners, but they were, they didn't own these things. They were just like, they would work with these companies and like, you guys need money to grow and turn things around or whatever the case mm -hmm. may be. And they'd go help them raise money. And then they're like, hey, we're actually good at picking winners and losers that are going to really be successful. And we're good at what we do in helping these companies. We're going to put our money where our mouth is and go invest in these. And because we're so good, we're going to do it in IRAs and do it in a tax deferred manner. Yeah. Now, they didn't use Roths. They used traditionals because Roths weren't around mm -hmm. back when Romney was doing this. <laughs> um, yeah. Peter Thiel yeah. is the next generation yeah. of yeah. those doing it. Went from a couple hundred like, million to billions. Billion, yeah. Romney just got hundreds. Poor yeah, guy. Yeah. Poor guy. Yeah, he's kind of a slouch. Yeah. 
Um, but there's others who have been in the news, Yelp founder, Max Levchin, who was also part of some of the PayPal early days. Um, and there's been a lot of others reported in the news, but, um, but this is something that is absolutely doable. Um, you got to invest in what you know and what you're good at. And um, also got to learn some of the tricks of the trade here on some of the tax rules and things to look out for. And I can see some already coming up in the questions here. Um, we're going to address quite a bit mm -hmm. of those. Okay, so why don't you go over like a self-directed IRA? Like, 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 let's say that someone's got an account at Fidelity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's a pretty easy process. You know, the first step is you got to open up an IRA account. If whatever kind of IRA account it is currently at Fidelity, that's typically what you're going to, you know, do over at a, you know, self-directed IRA custodian like directed IRA. So if it's, you know, tax deferred, you know, traditional, it would be a, you know, Fidelity, it's going to be a traditional over a directed. If it's a Roth over Fidelity, it'd be a Roth over here. We're not really going to get into stuff like Roth conversions or backdoor Roth accounts, but just know that that's always an option that you can take those tax deferred dollars and convert it to a Roth. And, you know, now it'll be tax free when you take any distribution after age 59 and a half. So the, the, the important thing to note is the very first step in everything in the process is you got to open the IRA account. The second step that you got to do is you got to get the funds from wherever it's currently at, you know, so if it's in fidelity and it's um, uh, in different stocks or mutual funds, those got to be liquidated. Okay. First, and then you're going to move that money over to fund your IRA account. And that's just called a trustee to trustee transfer. Uh, they'll typically, you know, wire ACH the funds over there. So there you go. Nice little diagram. Yeah. So, and so that, now you've got like an old 401k, let's say your old yeah. 401k is at Vanguard or Nationwide or whatever. Okay, well, you can roll that over to a self-directed IRA. And if it's a traditional 401k, it would go to a traditional self-directed IRA with a company like Directed IRA. There are some others out there. You don't need to know who they are. Um, they're terrible. They're not as good as us. So. Well, that, and that process takes a little bit longer when it's an old employer plan. Uh, you know, you, you typically have to contact them directly to request some, you know, paperwork uh, to, to roll out those funds. Um, if it's like already in an IRA or, you know, a, a brokerage account of like TD or something, then, you know, we can help initiate that after you've filled out the paperwork with us. But, you know, they typically, they're so old school, they like want to issue checks. So that could take, you know, a few weeks. So one, one thing to note is like, everything's like on timing. We get a lot of times people are like, you know, they got this great opportunity or this great investment that's come up, you know, or, hey, I want to get in on the next startup before it goes IPO or something. And, you know, because one of my buddies was one of the founders and they let me know. And let's say the IPO is in a couple weeks, like you got to get the ball rolling now. Yeah. Like timing is so critical and key on that. So and we've had those. I've had. And it's a know, bummer when you miss out. Rush, rushing. They're like doing this the last week and they knew about it. Yeah, we had one come up yesterday, or was it was it yesterday on a call? Like they're gonna launch, it's something in the crypto space. They're gonna launch yeah. something, and they're like, "Yeah, so we need to get this done in like a week." We're like, "Whoa, yeah, okay. how like, many people?" And yeah, there's like thirty. Do they even know what they're doing? No, like so. Um, timing. Give, yeah, give yourself some lead time. You know, um, and we'll talk about some strategies there. Um, okay, so basically, the the key point I want we want to make there on the front end is. You need to get to a self-directed IRA. Like you can invest in a private company at Merrill Lynch with your IRA mm -hmm. or Fidelity if you're an ultra high net worth client with a 50 million relationship or more. If you're not, they're not going to let you do it. They're like, you can't do that. And it's not because IRAs can't do it. It's because IRAs at Fidelity can't do it. And so you're going to need to come over to a custodian like directed IRA or that's what we do. We want you to buy this stuff. I and mean, you can buy stocks and mutual funds over here if you want, but you really come here because you want to buy invest in private companies, real estate, crypto, you know, the, the typical quote unquote alternative assets. So let's talk about some of the things you can do just to find deals and just some, some of the things that we see come through here. So um, roll back here a slide and these will be shared here. In fact, let me share my screen so you can see this one better. Yeah, that'd be good. I just want to break through, break through, <laughs> break, break down, down, break on through to the other side. Little, little doors, doors. Yeah. yeah, baby. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. You know, we just try to keep it light here. So, um, all right. There's a different type of 
structure out there when you get to investing on deals you could see where you can invest into. The first is you could just see a small business out there. Mm -hmm. It's somebody's LLC, or maybe they got a C-Corp and it's your friend or, you know, the person you golf with or do yoga with, I don't care. And they got their own little biz and they're yeah. like, hey, I need a partner. I need a cash investor to grow this thing. You know, I'm going to offer 20% to that partner. And, and, you know, there's some risk, obviously, that this doesn't work mm -hmm. out. But if it does, then, you know, you get 20% of the profits, 20% of the ownership of this thing. And so we see that all the time. Clients that are in a franchise, they're the cash partner in a franchise, or they're buying an existing business out, or it's even just startup cash that's needed to fund the business and operations of payroll of someone else and some initial inventory. Which is a big deal. Which a lot is a of people deal. need that. They can't get those private funds. Yeah. And they're elsewhere. like, or they're like, I don't want to do an SBA loan. I'd rather have yeah. a cash partner on this. Or SBA rejected me. Uh, and, and the SBA loans are like, oh, we'll give you an SBA loan. What assets are you buying with it? Yeah. Well, I need to hire employees and pay payroll and buy some inventory. And, yeah. you know, they're like, oh, you're not buying a piece of real estate with that SBA loan? Sorry. No, I'm leasing. It's like, yeah, yeah the loans are just tough out there. So, um, so this private capital, which can be an IRA, becomes... Uh, really important. We have lots of accounts over here that just own a little piece of a small business. Now, the first tip on that, here's one problem that comes up. IRAs can't own S-Corps. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of small businesses are S-Corporations. And so IRAs just cannot be an owner of an S-Corp. I'm going to give you one strategy we've done in that where I've had clients that wanted to give some funding to an, a small business that's an S-Corp, but they couldn't be a shareholder because IRAs just don't qualify as an S Corp shareholder, just under the S Corp tax rules. IRAs can own LLCs, IRAs can own limited partnerships, IRAs can own C Corps, but they just can't own S Corps. It's just a quirky rule. Now, um, here's what we did in that case, because this was a fast growing business, this S Corp. What we did was we structured it as a loan that could convert into stock, but they never converted it. And they sold their convertible note mm -hmm. instead, in a, a, basically in an equity position. So sometimes there's ways, even let's say you're an S corp, to say, all right, let me loan the money to that S corp because you can loan money to an S corp. Mm -hmm. Get some can't be a shareholder. Point. Yeah, you just can't own the stock. Yeah. But the client was like, I don't want to just be the lender though. I want the upside of this business mm -hmm. if it works out. Okay, let's put in a convertible option that the IRA can convert the note to stock if it wants. Now it would cause some tax issues if it did, but it had the right to which allowed them to sell that to someone else when the ownership of the thing went up. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so that was just one little structuring idea we did. Um, and I've done that. That's pure times. gold right there. Yeah. You'd have to get like a consult for something like yeah, that. It's just little, like, that's a little trick, you know, yeah. little trick. Uh, it's like a behind the back pass, yeah. you know? Um, so, um, so that's one little tip on the S corp and just small businesses. All right. The two lanes you're going to see out there when for a startup, particularly, or maybe a private company or fund is going to raise money, is there going to be a Reg D, mm -hmm. this is like 506C or 506B, we'll talk about those for a moment, or it's going to be what's called a crowdfunding offering. And sometimes crowdfunding is used generically. It could yeah. be a Reg D offering, actually, or it's a private placement. But they just use this word crowdfunding as a generic way to mean we're raising money from lots of people. But true crowdfunding is called Reg CF. And that is where the company can only raise $5 million. It used to be a million. This was upgraded um, uh, just this last year up to a total of $5 million now. So we're seeing a lot more Reg CF deals because startups can raise more money. Um, if you're unaccredited, you can invest in it, which Sweet. is pretty cool, right? Sweet. Um, you don't have to be an accredited investor. Anyone can invest in a, mm. in a crowdfunding offering. And if you can invest, your IRA can. Now, how much you can put in from you or your IRA depends on your net worth and income, and it ranges from on the minimum end of $2,000 up to a total amount of $100,000, and that's an annual how much you can invest. So um, that's not per deal. That's total how much you could invest in crowdfunding deals for the year. So that's those are the two, Reg D and crowdfunding. Now, like we had one that I reviewed um, a while ago, it was like in the dental space. It was like a tooth cleaning device type thing. There's actually a dentist investing in it um, with his IRA here. And that was a Reg D offering. It's a private company. They were raising, I think about 10 million. And this client put in a, I think 100 or 200,000 mm -hmm. from his IRA um, into the Reg D offering. Now this company was an LLC and it just bought shares or units essentially in the LLC. 
And, um, and of course, in the, these Reg D offerings, there's what's called a private placement or a sometimes called an offering memorandum if it's a 506C where they can advertise. But there's just some documents that, have, that are done. And then there's something called a subscription agreement. This is where you say, oh, I want to buy this much units or shares in the company. It's kind of like your contract to purchase the mm -hmm. shares. And so, but remember, you're not buying the units, mm -hmm. right? This is important, super important. Yeah. For the besting titling information. Like, yeah, like it's so messed they, up almost what, all so the time. Do. I mean, so it's, you it's, work it's, with a lot of private funds yeah, and so, company clients. So it's always like, you know, so you're you're an IRA account owner as an individual, right? But the IRA, so in this case, let's say you're using directed IRA, the directed trust company FBO for the benefit of, you know, Aaron Halderman Roth IRA. That's what's actually subscribing and, you know, purchasing those units or shares in the company. Okay. And, and I'm, I, it's for the benefit of my Roth. It's not Aaron Halderman? Yeah, no. <laughs> but we get that all the time. It'll be like Aaron Halderman Roth IRA. In, in the docs and we'll have to kick that back that, that's not correct it's it, it is my Roth IRA but it's directed trust company is the custodian of that asset and so that's super important that that vesting and titling information is correct and if it, it you know it won't get approved and it can delay that timing process that we we're talking about again like if you're running up on these deadlines like one of the cool things is we process things super quick over here at directed but some other custodians they they have a whole like it could be weeks or even a month on the underwriting. And that's typically what happens. They mess up on the amount of the units or they mess up on the vesting or titling information, you know, and, and kind of as an extra precautionary on our end, you know, we like you to sign as the individual account owner, like reading and approving it as, a, as you're authorizing that. Um, so you, you know, reviewed it. Now we're the ones signing on behalf of the IRA, directed trust company. Okay, so that's that's kind of the process, but you know it's important that that, that you understand that information of how it flows, and you know I, yeah, just get it done right the first time, <laughs> preferably. Yeah, and call us. We're here to you help, know, of course. Yeah. If you have an, if you have an account here, if your account's somewhere else, you know, can't help. You can't call them either, really. I mean, you'll be on hold oh. forever. But um, okay, so sorry, I don't mean to make shots at our competitors. <laughs> I'm just saying we just do a good job, and we're proud of it. So. Um, so the, the Reg D offerings, which is these are sometimes called the private placements, those are actually um, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. This is way back during Obama. It seems like forever ago. But this was a rule that allowed private companies to go raise money and advertise and solicit. So a lot of companies out there, like CrowdStreet, Start Engine, Republic, these are some ones we've had a lot of IRAs invest through. Um, they have deals. You can just go to their website, and they've got startups that are venture capital backed, some not, some are like, you know, top tier VC backed, and you can go search their sites for them. But we've had lots of IRAs here invest through those platforms, and those are crowdfunding platforms typically. And I mean, I like we did a video game one recently. I mean, just a whole mix of different things that you see. I always find it kind of fascinating mm -hmm. to see what people are investing into. I love that I get to be here for the long haul and then see these come out on the back end and which ones played out, which ones didn't, mm -hmm. you know, it'll be fun to see. But um, but there's risk, of course. I want to say that in these startups in particular, like the existing small business that just wants to grow, maybe a little less risky. They're yeah. established. You can look at their financials. Are you profitable? What's going on here? The startup that's got just a bunch of pro, pro formas and projections and they're burning money like crazy. They haven't made a cent yet. Like, you know, there's some risk there, obviously. And so you've got to really be diligent in understanding their business, that sector of the economy, um, get in lanes, you know, I always love seeing like a dentist or a doctor investing in like in their lane. Yeah. Like they know that space. We see a lot of tech clients that go in the tech route. They know what the next thing is that's needed in their space. And they are like, they figure a way to get their IRA into it. And so um, try to find things, you know, or where you can get resources where you can make a good analysis because the one thing with private companies which is something we love about real estate too is you can have a competitive advantage mm -hmm. i think it's impossible for the everyday investor like someone that has an actual job or has a business or a family or you know whatever all these things in your life to be like a professional trader every day with yeah. your retirement account it, you know and there's research after research that's proven that but where can you have an edge here private companies mm -hmm. startups real estate 
These are the things that you can find deals. I always like to say good, good deals are not sold. Good deals are found. Mm -hmm. You go find the stuff that's going to fit. So how do you do that? How do you find that? And, I, and a lot of clients ask me that, like they're waiting for me to be like, oh, you haven't heard about XYZ company that's making this cool thing? Yeah. Go invest in them. You just go to this website. I wish I could do that. But here's some ideas where I would go. Because this is where I speak. Okay, I go speak to these places I'm going to give you here. And I go tell them, hey, all you people, you can use an IRA to invest in all these companies that you're dealing with. So the first one I would say is look for angel investment groups. Every place in the U.S. has one. Every big city or state has an angel network, at least one of them. Mm -hmm. Now, these mostly you need to be an accredited investor, which means you have to have 250000 in annual income or a million dollar net worth, one of the two. Excluding your personal residence. Yeah, uh, the yeah. network's excluding your personal residence. But if you are an accredited investor, you can join these, a lot of these angel groups. Now, some of them have different criteria. Like, I think next week I'm speaking to like... Um, it's a medical and science one. Like you mm -hmm. have to work in that industry to be part of that That's angel cool. network, but they only vet companies and startups that are in the medical or science space. And so they've kind of aligned with what do we know? Mm -hmm. Let's pay hey, all you people that are doing, you know, biotech or medical devices or some, something in the science realm, you know, come, you got the next vaccine for COVID, whatever, come to us and we're going to pitch here. And then we can invest. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the people there will go say, I'm an angel. I want to throw in 50 grand for my IRA, you know, um, and maybe I'll throw in 50,000 personally too. And those will be two separate investments. But, um, uh, but that, that's one thing is find angel groups. Like here in, um, in Arizona, it's called desert angels is a big one. Um, I've spoken in SoCal, but there's multiple chapters in California to tech coast angels, mm -hmm. um, very active um, angel network group. But these are groups of people that are all wanting to invest in startups and they just hear the pitches. Companies come, tell them what they're doing to have their deck and they come pitch. It's like, it's like you're on Shark Tank, mm -hmm. you know? You could be investing in the next Dr. Squatch So, Oh, was that on Shark Tank? I don't know. Oh, okay. <laughs> I just like the soap. <laughs> Aaron was doing a little plug there for Dr. Squatch So. I hope to get sponsored. <laughs> yeah, I hope to see if we can get your IRA in there. They, they were on the, in the Super Bowl. They were they bought a Super Bowl ad. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right. So look at angel groups. The mm -hmm. other I would say to go to is a lot of states and cities have incubator programs. Mm -hmm. So they will put some government money in. There's usually a public-private partnership that's investing in certain startups. And go find those state or kind of government private partnership incubator programs in your area. They have meetings, they'll have events. Mm -hmm. Like you can go meet the people starting these. Those people are always looking for money. You know, yeah. that, that they, they live off of that. They're startups, you know? Um, and so, so that's where you wanna be. You wanna be where people need your money. So look, look to there. I've seen clients be successful in that. Um, I had one client that actually would teach at this incubator program. Um, as a CPA, they would just go kind of teach some accounting and financial stuff to a lot of these startups and kind of got into some of the details, helped a lot of them. It's like, yeah. this one's going to be awesome. I'm going to invest my IRA into it. Awesome. Like that is like pretty cool, I think. Um, so it's not like there's like a quick and easy thing. Just go to XYZ website and you can go find the next cool mm -hmm. thing. I mean, maybe you can go to some of these websites I put up on the screen here, like CrowdStreet or Start Engine or Republic. There's many more. Um, like, um, you know, if you're part of like EO or if you like, or Y Combinator, there's like, you can do some research like yeah. on, on different groups too, that like networks that you can become a member with that have certain like requirements that like they kind of network and do yeah. their own deals together. You can get stuff. into Y Combinator, by the way, punch your ticket, tell me, I'm going to get my IRA over there with you. So, but. <laughs> You know, but yeah, why not shoot for the stars, right? Yeah, yeah. So um, there's so many big companies that came out of that, by the way. Um, but that, that's what I just want to say is just kind of maybe find something in your lane, find where there's kind of a new business startup community, look for these incubator programs, look for angel groups if you're an accredited investor. Um, I, I mean, you know, I, 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 there's lots of places you can go just to network. Yeah. But a lot of it comes down to just like the deals we see over here. It's like someone in their network. Someone they knew, a family member, a friend, 
it's even just like being a good freaking neighbor sometimes like you just like you just know more people you just are going to see more deal flow and if people know you're an investor too and i always say this with clients that are looking for self-directed deals the people in your network do people you know know that you have money to invest and you like to invest in small businesses or if you're into real estate you invest in real estate if you know that you have people come to you yeah and i have clients that have huge deal flow on large accounts and that's how they've done it people know they come to them when they're like oh can I get 500,000 for a rehab project and a purchase on a property? Oh, I've got this small business over here that needs money. Do you, I've, I've, this is another friend of mine of a friend that, and then you get these connections. And so sometimes it might feel a little awkward to talk about it. Like, Oh, and this my IRA or I'm an investor in Mm -hmm. small businesses and whatever things you're into, but um, it can provide conversation and context for all the people that you know, to then help send you deals. So this isn't to be construed, nor is it investment advice, but I couldn't stress the importance of what you said about staying in your lane yeah. of what you know. Like these are retirement, your retirement dollars in a retirement account. Like, you know, be comfortable with what you're doing and, you know, have some, have some knowledge and background and do your due diligence on it as well. Because there's like, there's no collateral, right? It's not like investing in a real estate deal or a note that has, you know, secured collateral or a UC filing or something like it's, it's, there's no security, right? Like, like it could go to zero. Yeah. You know, like so. your real estate, you buy a piece of real estate, it could go down. It's not going to go to zero. Today. Exactly. But, um, or even a secured note, you know, unless you're like in a way late position, but, um, but yeah, the, the private company can go to zero. Oh, I have another, but note. it can also go hundred X, you yeah. know, thousand X. It could go huge. And that's why people like Peter Chubb with 5 billion Roth IRAs. So you just got to be able to call out the Facebook versus the MySpace. Yeah. yeah you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's a good point. Um, the Google versus Ask Jeeves. I mean, it was, it was a hard call back in 2000. Although I think they still all sold. Yeah, they probably, like, probably you know, stole. And that's, that's another thing I'll say is like, um, where you've seen already a lot of accounts exit on in private company investments is the company got bought. Yeah. They got acquired. They didn't go public. They got bought out at a huge multiple. Uh, and you and still got paid. Yeah, they got, still got great paid returns. I mean, I we got some really large accounts here that, that have had some of those um, on some companies you guys probably know, which is cool. And a lot of companies you never heard of. <laughs> but we, I was like, of course, I get a little interested in it. So I can move on. Can I fill a few questions? Yeah, let's hit some Q&A. So I, we get this a lot. And there's a couple in here on that. They're, they're, they're basically like prohibited transaction type stuff, which is... We get asked all the time, especially at the at the trust company, even Matt and his law firm, like, you know, can I do this or can I invest this way or can I invest into this with my IRA? And so, uh, you know, I don't know, I'd say it's 50-50 whether we shoot it down or, or not, you know. Like, yeah, like if you're, here's where on the private transaction, I think the easy thing is, if you're like, I'm just investing in this. Oh, you don't work there? Cool. No, you're not a, on the board. You don't already personally own shares. Easy. Don't worry about it unless it's like your spouse's company or, you know, your kid's company, mm-hmm. like those cause prohibited transactions. So you got to avoid deals with companies you personally already own or anyone prohibited to you, like your spouse or kids. Well, what if I'm the one starting it up? Well, you can start up with your IRA from the beginning, but if you've already started it up and started it and personally put money in and started working in it, now we've got some problems and you'll need a consult. And there's some possibilities there, like, you know, there's, but that's really high level planning. So for, what I want to talk about today, and maybe we do a webinar on that later about how Probably. to start up your own startup. Um, but I'll just say that's super common. There's like less than 20 attorneys in the country. I consider myself one of them that understand how the heck to do that. Um, but uh, but for the most part, and I think what most people are going to do is it's like, no, I just want to invest in this XYZ company, yeah. this whatever soap company Aaron likes, you know, I've heard they're selling shares. I'm going to go buy some, you know, they got a private placement or a reg D deal or yeah. they're on their crowdfunding right now and raising capital. Um, so, um, so that's the first check is just, right. That's, that, I think that's the first check is, are there prohibited transactions? Mm-hmm. Now, if you're on the board or maybe you're an officer and you own like one or 2%, you're probably okay too. All right. Mm-hmm. But if it's like, no, I'm the biggest owner in this company mm-hmm. and I'm the CEO. And now I want to put my Roth IRA in there or even my traditional IRA. Mm-hmm. You're going to want to have a tax consult with a, with a competent attorney, whether it's us or there's others out there. There's, there are some competent people out there on it. You're going to need some tax planning on that for sure. Because that, that's, 
there's nuance on how to pull that off. Sometimes you can't, but there's some nuance on how to pull it off. But again, if you're just like, you know, you're like senior vice president, board member, own 1%. Cool. Yeah, you're good. Your IRA is fair game. Do you, um, so another thing we get a lot is, hey, so I own, so I invested, um, I invested in this small business personally. Yeah. Oh, I need, but I need to get it over into my Roth. Yeah. I know. Like, we, we, like that, we get that every day. Yeah. You know, which I, gosh, guys, I wish you could. <laughs> I really do. You can't. Uh, you can't. Yeah. You just can't. There's no legit way to do it. And I'll have clients be like, well, why don't I sell it to my brother? Yeah. My brother's not Ooh. prohibited. Yeah. And then my IRA will buy those shares for my brother. Can I do that? No. No. It's a stepped transaction. Yeah. So. Okay. That's, a, that's a bummer too. Like, yeah. So what we do tell clients is you can buy more shares in that company with your retirement mm-hmm. account now. And they're always like, well, now it's all gone up in value. That's yeah. why I want to get out of my personal It was a dollar. Now it's $30. So like, well, sorry. I know. So that's the tax rules just at play. I mean, and that's fair from the IRS standpoint. They don't want you to invest in stuff personally. And then once it goes up, they're like, oh, let me put it over my Roth IRS and I'll pay tax. You get to know tax it with the Roth IRA, but it's got to go in from the beginning and take the risk. Yeah. You know, it, if you want all the upside, you got to come in the beginning to take the risk. The, the other thing I'll say too, uh, just backtracking to the vesting and titling that we went over earlier, because a few of you have, were asking this question. If you have what's called a checkbook IRA LLC structure, which is totally cool with us, you know, you'll, you'll have the IRA at directed IRA and that IRA at directed will fund your LLC bank account, that business bank account, okay? And you have what's checkbook control and whatever the name of that LLC is what will be the best entitling information in that small business or startup. Totally cool. Like you're, you're gonna, you know, wire the money, ACH it or whatever at that point out of that bank account to do that investment. So yeah. that's totally fine. It's not gonna be directed trust company, FBO, Matt Sorensen, Roth IRA. It'll, yeah. be, it'll be like Sorensen Investments, LLC. Yeah, you just kind of got like a three-step thing. IRA, IRA owned LLC, ABC startup. IRA LLC owns ABC startup, right? And so oh, that's and, absolutely possible. And the same goes for a solo 401k structure as well. Because that, yeah, that, 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 the title only be in the name of your the, the solo 401k. Yeah. That entity you set up at the with your bank as well. So just wanted to make sure you hit on that because people were confused. All right. Are there any other primitive transaction questions? You so, want to get? well, we have some u bit stuff I want to talk about. But. So I do. Um, we answered anonymous attendee. He's starting a biotech. Oh, wait, hold on. He says, I'm starting a, I'm, I'm starting a startup in biotech. I'm in Arizona. I'm getting five patents for five different products. And I want to put the startup in my self-directed IRA. I have Matt's second edition of the SDRI handbook. <laughs> All right, well, thank you, anonymous yeah. attendee. Yeah. Um, so you haven't started it. He's saying he hasn't started it yet. Yeah. He, but he's is, getting the patents. This is tricky because you're a little bit along with the patents. So I've done this before with clients. I had a, I had some clients years ago do a, they built some software, um, but it's like you guys can't program this and make the software oh, yeah. if your IRAs are going to own it. Your IRAs are going to need to go pay someone else to go develop this technology and the software. Okay, so they did that. They formed an LLC. This is a group of six or seven guys. Mm-hmm. They put in money from their Roth IRAs. They were like college friends and everything. And they put all this money in this LLC. Then the LLC went and paid um, to have the software developed. And then the software then got licensed out to customers. Um, and so their Roth IRAs essentially owned this LLC that that ended up getting the patents all assigned to it, but they paid other people to do it. So if you're like the inventor on the patent, because you have to actually put a person's name on these names, that's not going to work. If your Roth IRA then owns that patent or the, or the patent gets transferred to the company your Roth IRA owns. So you want to make sure that the technology or the, the patent you're getting in the biotech company, that whatever that is, that you didn't do it. Like you can have the idea and concept, but you're not, you can't be the inventor if your Roth IRA is going to come. I just never figured out a way that would work. And I think in tax court, the tax court judge is going to take a real literal interpretation. So would the IRS and just be like, 
you're the inventor over here that has all these patents. You put this over here in your company that's owned by your Roth IRA. How is that not a private transaction? So, so there's some timing there. I don't know if it'll still work, an honest attendee in your situation. Um, and, and, but it's possible if you can say, well, I'm going to have other people do it. Because remember, you can't just be doing all the work for your IRA. Like you can be involved from oversight and management and be involved. But if it's just your IRA, you can't be involved in working in it. And a lot of people are like, but how come Peter Till did it, Matt? You know, he was the president of PayPal. And how does his Roth IRA did it? Have you seen the PayPal Mafia pictures? There's like 10 co-founders in that company. Mm -hmm. All right. It, it, he didn't have a majority. Mm -hmm. Okay. He was one of many different co-founders. Elon that was in there. Yeah. yeah. And so, so, so his Roth IRA was only a piece of that with everyone else. He may have been the face or the, one of the leaders in PayPal at that time, but, but that was, he just did it through his Roth. So that's why it works. So also, it's much easier to pull off if you have more than a few partners. If it's just you or another partner, it's also pretty hard to pull off. But if you're like, no, there's like five of us coming into it. Okay, we got something to work with here. Yeah. It's just a little bit more to work with under the rules um, on privileged transactions. And it's, it's a little bit easier, I think, to get through some of the problems. I had, we've been getting this lately, and I find it kind of interesting. Um, I guess we can have a quick dialogue on it because it came up in the chat too, or in the Q&A on uh, why do I need to be an accredited investor if it's my IRA that, that's, a, that's investing? And how would I even demonstrate proof that I am an accredited investor? Like, what are they, how am I showing that if, if my net worth is really in the valuation of my business? That's, that's a great question. Yeah, that's a good question. So if an individual qualifies as an accredited investor, so does their IRA. Okay, so you individually qualify as an individual investor under the SEC rules. And, um, you know, there's the income test, which is easier because you can just use tax returns to show your prior two years tax returns. I mean, I have the 200,000 annual income, single 300,000 annual income married. That, I think I stated the rule wrong earlier. 200,000 annual income, single 300,000 annual income married. And, um, okay, that's how you're going to do it to qualify as an individual. If you're individually qualified, so does your um, IRA account or 401k. Now, let's say you're going to qualify on the net worth side. Um, on the net worth side, you can qualify, but you don't get to count the equity in your home. And you're going to need to show documentation of what your value is. Now, if you have a small business, that is kind of hard to value if that's where if you need that to get to a million. So um, I don't know if you have some third party professional CPA, someone that can do a valuation of that, you know, would probably have to occur to, to verify that. Because in the accredited investor world, when you invest in a lot of these companies, you have to prove that you're accredited. Mm -hmm. In the old days, and, and even in some of the current offerings now that are truly private, that are not advertised, that are truly private, you just check the box and say you're accredited or not. Those are called 506B. So some if it's called a private placement, that's called a 506B or a PPM. And in those ones, you don't need to show you're accredited. You just have to check a box and say you are. There's no verification needed. But the more common version of where a 506 or a private offering now where there's um, it's this Reg D type offering, most of those are being advertised under a rule called 506C. And sorry for all the like legal citations here, but just, there's some technical points that are important. Under that 506C, basically the compromise with the SEC was, we're going to let you guys go advertise to get investors for your startup or your small business, but they have to prove they're accredited investors to get in. Mm -hmm. You can only take their money if they prove that they're accredited. Well, income's easy because here's my tax returns. You know what I mean? Or here's a letter from my CPA saying my adjusted gross income for the past two years was X and Y. Okay. Like you can get a little more specificity like or it's, it's kind of easier to nail down on income the net worth and asset test takes a little more work because you got to do a whole worksheet you may be able, you may have five million of assets but you also got to disclose your liabilities because mm -hmm. it's a net worth analysis it's not just do you have a million in assets no it's your net worth so you got to work through the whole thing calculator on that now there are some websites out there that will you can pay a fee that will verify you as an accredited investor mm -hmm. um and so in fact if you just google 
like um, a creditor, accredited investor verification, you'll find a bunch of companies that pop up and some of them do it for a couple hundred bucks. Yeah. Um, some are, most are actually less than a hundred now. Yeah, it's kind of gotten like cheaper so. and cheaper and they kind of, they have data you enter in to, to prove it. And and so um, so you you will face that in the, in the accredited investor world. Um, so let's, uh, let me let me just restate again, if you already have a business or if you're going to sell your existing business, you're not moving those proceeds or liquidity event into a retirement account. Okay. We I just had a few more of those questions come in. So we just, we hit on it a little bit earlier, but again, just a recap there. Can't do it. Do not pass go. There is no get out of jail free card on that one. That's monopoly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I played that with my kids. Yeah. Oh. So sorry about that. Um, and that, I mean, man, if we had a strategy for that, that'd be like lightning in a bottle. That'd be just like, something nobody's got, but there's just not a legit strategy to do it, um, unfortunately. Before and, we, frankly, the rules are designed and the intent of them are to prevent that. It, it's just not fair. Yeah. It's not fair from a tax standpoint. Yeah. So you just gotta Everybody play the game. would do it. Everybody would do yeah. it then. Yeah, it's just like, it's like picking up your piece and going around the board five <laughs> times being like, that's a thousand bucks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And I'm like, oh, I didn't know you yeah. could do that. <laughs> I mean, I get why you want to do it. I get why everybody asks. You know, I love it you if know. you can do it. Oh my gosh, that'd be awesome. I, I know I you're it. looking for the answer of yes, and that's why it's even being asked, but it's just no. Um, before we hit you bit, because that's okay. important. Yeah. I want to, so Minaj is asking, can, I, can an IRA own multiple LLCs? If so, do you recommend opening one for crypto and another for startup investments? Um. Yes, an IRA can own multiple LLCs. Um, I don't think you need to separate out crypto and startup investments. You know, we have our crypto IRA with Gemini, where you get a Gemini wallet and can do everything at Gemini's, you know, right directly through an IRA. Mm -hmm. So you may want to separate that just because we have really a split product with Gemini. If you're like, no, I want to use my own LLC and have my own wallet with the LLC that I can control. That's okay. It's a little bit of work to mm -hmm. get a That's wallet a in the LLC name. It's not as easy as you might think and for those that haven't gone down that route yet, but it's possible you get a, a wallet in the LLC that you can hold the crypto and exchange it, sell it, you know, whatever you want to do. So, but that same LLC could own, you know, stakes in private companies. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, my LLC owns a rental property and the cash flow has been buying crypto for years. So, and it has a wallet just because I did it before we had the Gemini product. I also do the Gemini product myself with my with my Roth IRA. This is my 401k with the LLC and the rental. But um, yeah, absolutely. You can do that. Cool. Um, okay. Yeah. Let's hit, let's hit on, let's hit on the UBIT because that actually did come in. Some of those questions okay. are already answered by staff. Yeah. But this is good. Okay. What is, what, what, what the UBIT? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, these four letter words. Um, okay. So, th so UBIT's this tax that can apply to IRAs. So IRAs are designed to receive investment income, right? Like interest income, dividend income, capital gain income when you sell an asset, rental income if you own real estate, like that's all investment income. And IRAs don't pay tax when they get investment income. But if an IRA gets business income, it becomes subjected to this unrelated business income tax. Well, am I gonna get business income when I'm investing in a startup? Maybe, I don't know, depends. Let's, let's run through some examples here. The first thing is there's a lot of exemptions to UBIT. And let me just go here and start sharing uh, my screen here. There we All go. Right. So there's a lot of exemptions to UBIT. Let's, let's look at the exemptions first here. Dividend income. If, if the startup or private company you're investing into, and many startups that are wanting to go big or C corporation. All right. So you're just going to buy C corporation shares. Those C corporations pay out dividends to shareholders. When you sell the shares, you get capital gain. You'll never have UBIT in that scenario. So if you're doing C corps, you know, you're totally fine. Stop. Don't even worry about UBIT. Carry on. Okay. All right. Now, the common one we will see UBIT have issues are LLCs. LLCs are passed through entities. See, a C corp pays corporate tax. Mm -hmm. And the company pays tax at the corporate level and has profit. Then it pushes down profits to the owners, which for IRAs is just investment income. But, and, and the kind of the, the trade off with the IRS and Congress was well, we won't make IRAs pay tax on money from C Corps because 
they already paid a corporate tax. The yeah. IRS got something out. 20, 21%. Yeah, yeah, which is currently 21%. All right. So now LLCs, on the other hand, they don't pay tax at the corporate level, at the company level. The tax liability falls down to the owners based on the profit of the company. Now, if the company has losses, you never need to worry about this. And that's a key point I'm going to come back to in a second, because that actually happens a lot in startups that can sell for hundreds of millions of dollars and have never freaking made one cent of profit. Okay. All right. We'll come back to that in a second. LLCs are pastor entities. So they push down their income, which is business income. If it's an operating business, they're mm -hmm. selling products or goods and services. And if you're getting that business income down to your IRA or 401k, it's going to cause this tax called UBIT. The tax rate is 37%. Your IRA has to file its own tax return, which is a 990T, which is on you to do. I mean, we can help at the law firm, but your custodian doesn't do this. Nobody does. You know, you got to engage a professional to handle this for you. So you got to kind of know this. This is why I say this is important, why we cover it here. All right. Now, what happens when you're invested in an LLC is that those are typically taxed as partnerships. Mm -hmm. What a partnership does is it files its own company tax form. Says, here's all the money that we made. And here's our profit or our loss. And then we're going to issue what's called a K1 to every partner for their share of the profit loss. So if the company made $100,000 in profit and my IRA owned 2% and I, I'm, I'm then entitled to basically 2,000 of that 100,000, mm -hmm. whether the company distributes the money to my IRA or not, or the company just keeps it okay. to keep growing the business, doesn't matter. They're going to send my IRA a K-1 for $2,000 of profit. All right. Who's doing that? That's a partnership tax return, right? And that the, has, yeah, the company is doing the partnership tax return. So like whatever company you've invested into, or this could be a fund even, you know, their company is going to do the return, but they're going to issue the K-1 to your IRA which would say, you know, would be to you personally, it's going to be the directed trust company, FBO. Let's say this is Aaron's IRA, Aaron Halderman, Roth IRA. And our tax ID at directed trust company is used on there. Don't put your social on it. Don't, you know. And don't put your business EIN on there. Like, if you think you have one. Like, yeah, just don't do that. Yeah, use your IRA, <laughs> okay? Um, and so, so you might have UBIT in that scenario. Now, if... If your strategy is startup that you're going to sell for profit, I don't really care about that. If you have UBIT year to year, it's not going to be much. You're not investing in this thing to hold it in cash flow. You're investing in the startup typically because you think it's going to go big and sell for a huge profit. And frankly, a lot of startups that have even gone public or that have um, been acquired for you know nine figure sums, um, they haven't even had one cent of profit. They just have a huge fast growing business that some other company wanted to acquire. And so, or that they, you know, they knew they could take public and raise more money. So in that scenario, cool, is getting K-1s all along, but they all had losses. Mm -hmm. so Easy, yeah, you don't have so UBIT, there's no UBIT on losses. Um, and some of these will convert from an LLC to a C-Corp to go public because it's much easier as a public company, excuse me, to convert to a C-Corp for tax purposes. So sometimes we see that. Um, all right, now here's one you got to be wary of, though. Let's say it's an LLC and it's a small business that you're like, I just want to cash flow this. Mm -hmm. I just want to be the cash partner at 20%. And I just want the profits. I don't, I'm not looking to sell this. Like, you know, maybe the small business will sell at one point, but I'm yeah. really looking like to just hold this as an investment. Mm, you're going to have UBIT along the way. So you want to look at that. It's not the end of the world. I'm not saying don't do it. But just, in the future. Yeah, just know you've got UBIT that's going to be coming up and it is a 30% rate and you will file a 990T tax return and the IRA pays it. Okay, this is not on your personal 1040. You don't pay it. The IRA actually pays it. That's important. Okay. Well, any clarifications uh, on UBIT or any questions generated by that? Again, UBIT just applies to a retirement account. Like, and not, it doesn't apply if you've also invested personally. Right. But UBIT is specific to retirement accounts um in the rs code so yeah we got a lot of people doing mining bitcoin mining you know looking to do that start the llc or yeah. do their solo 401k you know and have it invest in an llc like i get that and y'all are bringing money in bringing investors bringing self-directed ira investors like it, that's all good but that that will generate a bit yeah Mm -hmm. um, I see a question there from Petyo about 
Oh, asset so, protection. Of asset protection. So investing in a private equity fund or any private company really um, through a self recognized is it better to invest through LLC using like the IRA LLC or directly with, with, with the, IRA. the IRA name, yeah. directly from the IRA. That Again, that directed trust company, FBO or yeah. Sorensen Investments LLC. <laughs> yeah, it's, I, I think if you have the LLC already, just use the LLC, but I wouldn't set up the LLC just to make that investment in a private fund or private company. Because the company, the private fund is an LLC or limited partnership or the private company is a corporation. Whatever. They already have the company corporate asset protection level there. Your IRA is one shareholder of many in there. You're getting the benefit of that already. If you create another entity below that, like an LLC, that's not necessarily really helping you. You already have the corporate, you know, veil asset protection up there of the fund you're invested into or of the operating company, the startup that you're owning shares in. I don't think you need to do the, you know, another layer there. I mean, just think of your IRA buying Microsoft stock, you know? I mean, if you do that personally, do you go set up an LLC that owns the Microsoft stock? No, you don't need to do that. There's, Microsoft's got its corporation with a corporate veil that's protecting you as a shareholder. Creditors of Microsoft can't come after you personally. But like I said, if you already have the LLC, cool, use it. It's easy. Just do it for convenience, not necessarily for asset protection. Now, I know everybody's got a different little flavor of asset protection. Some people love it and want to go all in on it. Some people are like, I don't want to do it if it makes my life complicated. Mm -hmm. So if you're like a belt and suspenders type of person that likes to wear the belt and the suspenders, maybe do the IRA LLC, but you know, don't, don't worry about it. I was going to try and make a joke about keeping your pants up the, with, with your, I don't know. I just, I just couldn't connect it next time. Yeah, for next time. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to workshop that joke before I give that out because that could go terribly wrong if I mess that one up. <laughs> um, my I, let's do this one. My IRA buys preferred stock 20, uh, 20% interest rate in the C-Corp, okay, in which my LLC owns 60% of the C-Corp stock, and I'm a controlling officer member of both the C-Corp and the LLC. Hmm. What's the question? I think it's prohibited transaction. Oh, okay. I think exactly I mean, I got it's a PT. Yeah, I've got flags flying off, yeah. and it's just the summary of facts and description there. Yeah. I'm worried about a prohibited transaction based on those percentages. I just don't know the involvement of what you're doing, what the company is doing. Consult. Yeah, you really need a consult. That's quite complicated. Like I always tell clients, like, all right, if you want your IRA to invest in a company where you're already involved personally. Remember, if you're just like below 10% or you're just one officer of many or one board member of many, I'm not as concerned. But if you're the largest owner of that company and you want your IRA to be an investor in it, or you're the CEO or chairman of the board, like I'm a little, like there's some stuff that you got to talk through. Mm -hmm. Like it's, that's a very nuanced discussion of problems that can arise that could trip you up. So it's kind of like I say, if you own 50% or more and your IRA wants to come in now, can't do it. If you own between 10 and 40, 11 and 49%, it's a gray area, 39 shades of gray, really. Great movie, by the way. And then um, and then 10% or below, though, that's, that's a joke. That's not a movie. Oh, that wasn't a movie yeah. for all those <laughs> wondering. <laughs> uh, that was a book. That was a book. They made a movie on it. They did. OK. Um, so 10% or below, though, is like I said, I wouldn't stress it out unless you're doing something weird or there's some sweetheart deal. Now, here's one that I that we got to be careful about. Um, this is one we had just the other day, a consult on. Um, it was a startup company that had options for employees. They wanted to push those stock options that the employees had to Roth IRAs. Can't do that, okay? Um, because the options are earned as part of doing work for the company. It's an employee benefit. Mm -hmm. It's a reduced price than anybody could buy the shares. And so, you know, if the company's gone up, now those options are super valuable. But you got those because of personal work and services, part of personal compensation. Letting your Roth IRA exercise options you personally hold would be a privileged transaction because it's really moving an asset that you personally are entitled to, mm -hmm. these options, over to your Roth IRA. So that's one that's prohibited. You're going to have to watch out for. I did have something come up. Uh, just wanted to address on the solo 401k side for UBIT. Uh, because Matt did. It, uh, it's not exempt. 
from you that it's exempt from what's called UDFI, which is a form. Yeah, on um, leveraged real estate only. So that that's what it's exempt from. So just a quick note there, a few of you had questions on that. Like the, it's often interchanged, the, those two words, UBIT, UDFI, but it, it, you can have UBIT in a solo 401 okay. Yeah, um, and that's a common misconception, by the way. I always get people who are like, 401ks don't have UBIT. I have a solo 401k. Yeah, they do. Yeah. They just don't have UDFI on leveraged real estate. That's the only little distinction. All other UBIT, all things we're talking about here so far, the UBIT applies to a four, solo 401k. Um, okay, any final questions you want to do or you want to wrap up? Mark has a good one. So he takes... Um, industrial buildings warehouse whatever and converts them to self-storage yeah. conversions there it's managed uh by one of the large self-storage reads so they're not doing anything day-to-day -day operations they just convert the buildings he's like on my next one could i do it with my solo k or my raw into the llc invest in llc as long as my partner is signing for the debt or would i need a c blocker which, which seems dangerous with current administration. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes. I love it. You're going down a good lane. This is cool. That yeah. That, cool that could be a good one. Yeah. See that, that right there, that question is how you're successful. That's prime time. Because you've already figured out how to do something personally and what you're good at. You know it, you get the deal flow, you mm -hmm. see it, you figured it out. Like you've worked it already, you know, now it's how I use an IRA to do the next one. Mm -hmm. This is what he, so I love the LLC. If you're going to get debt, I would probably use a solo K if you got it because of this UDFI exemption on leverage debt. You can't sign the debt. You're smart. You figure that out. Your partner can though, as long as your partner's not like your father, you know, mother, spouse. It's not a disqualified kids, person. Not a disqualified person, just some other business partner. Cool. And then absolutely that LLC could go out and run that deal, buy the property, sell it off. Get all the gain back in the solo K. You can do a Roth solo K account within your solo K. If you want to choose it even more, well, I mean, if you're into the Roth stuff. I think we should end on a high note. Yeah, that's pretty good. That. Okay. <laughs> like, uh, we'll, end, we'll end with that one. Here, here's what I'll say on that, the, the, that additional comment is uh, it's cool what Matt said. You already have something that you're doing, you know, or if it's your business or know if somebody else doing, and now you want to, you know, get it into a retirement account as an investment. That's a great question that you should just be asking yourself. Like, what do I know currently or what am I doing currently? And how can I somehow figure out a way to do that on my next deal, on my next deal, not the current one, on the next one uh, with my retirement account? That'd be sweet. Mm -hmm. Like, just ask yourself that question. So thank you. That's cool. Good. All right. You want to hit the promo? Yeah. Do we have it up there? There we go. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Just, yeah I mean, I go. probably... We, oh, we should have oh, webinar. It should have been webinar 100. Webinar 100. Sorry. That's all right. You can use either one. So, yeah. you, so if you open up an account at Directed IRA, um, it's just for people that come and attend our webinars. It's a sweet, sweetheart of a deal. Uh, we're, I mean, we're already so competitive and just have a low annual flat fee of $295. So regardless if you have $1,000 or $10 million in the account, doesn't matter to us. And it doesn't matter how many investments you make either. We just have that low annual account fee of $295 and then certain transaction fees one time when you make an investment. That's it. Super cool, super easy. So if you go ahead and do webinar 100 or Sorensen 100 on the account application, and it's all, all our account applications can be done electronically, e-signed, electronically signed. We have a pretty cool platform that you can use on your iPhone right now if you want or an iPad. Take you like five, seven minutes or so. So, and you just enter that in for the referral or how you heard about us, and we'll take $100 off for the first year uh, fees. So that $295 will be $195, and we'll just bill that, and then a year from now, it'll be $295. So that's it. What will be year three, four from now? $295. Yeah. <laughs> so pr pretty easy. So we, we thank you all, and glad you could be on here, and uh, come out to the summit live in person. If you feel comfortable with that, and you want to come out and network, There'll, there'll be people that have deal flow, that has deal flow, private companies there, you know, so it'll be a great opportunity to network. Go to sdiresummit.com. You can check that out too.
Yeah, and upcoming webinars, we're gonna be doing a part two on crypto. If you, mm -hmm. any of you haven't seen our crypto webinar, we did a couple months ago, go check that out. It's in the webinar history, it's recorded, slides are there too. We're gonna do a part two on crypto, go a little more deep. I see a lot of crypto questions mm -hmm. popping up, so I just wanna note that. We also gonna talk about some private REITs. We see accounts investing into those. Mm -hmm. Those are a little more niche type real estate deals where you can invest in a I small- I think that's October. Group. Okay, yeah, I October. think we're doing that in October. So we're gonna do crypto in September then, part two. And a little more crypto advanced, I think, for IRAs. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, then we'll, what we'd love to see at the summit. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Aaron. Yeah. Um, and to look for the recording. Please share with your friends. And we'll get the slides up there on the website as well. Until then, stay calm and self direct on. All right. Bye, everyone.